شاطئ في يديه كفارة للخطايا وشاطئ في يديه كفارة للخطايا ذهبت يوما إليه وشقايا ورحت ألق عليه تبت لي وهدايا يا 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 رجائي يا رجائي يا رجائي يا رجائي الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد المرسلين مولانا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن سبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد uh, Respected brothers, sisters, respected scholars السلام عليكم ورحمة الله No matter which dar al-ulum you go to whatever part of the world it is for a former student, it's like coming back home. That's how it feels. Nothing gives us more happiness to come to an Islamic institute, a Dar al And this one obviously has a special place in my heart because Mufti Wasim, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him, was one of our colleagues when we studied at Binuri town, I was I think in Thalitha or Thania, he was in Dora, he was also uh, one of our roommates and mashallah you are very fortunate to have Mufti Sahib because he was a very very keen student even in those days he would mashallah expend himself in his studies and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve the institute Let me take you back about 1400 years to the Arab Peninsula, a place now known as the Hijaz. And let me draw for you a picture of that area at that time. This was a place which really nobody ruled. But surrounding it, all the other areas were ruled. So you had, at that time, you had two dominant powers. You had the Persians, who were the superpower of the day. And their kingdom spanned from Iraq, which accommodate Iraq. And in Madain is where they had their capital in Iraq, and it spanned all the way to India. That's how powerful they were. On the other hand, you had the Byzantines, the Eastern Ro Roman, and their kingdom spanned from Sham, which is today is Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, parts of Yemen, all the way towards Europe. And then in between this, you had this small little area called the Hijaz. Nobody ruled this area. The truth is, nobody wanted to rule this area. Because of the unruly disposition of the Arabs that lived here. Then, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and the Prophet ﷺ was unlettered. And one of the reasons that Allah kept the Prophet ﷺ unlettered was that he wanted to show this miracle. That nobody could say thereafter that the Prophet ﷺ took from the books of the Romans or the teachings of the Persians. And he came and he transformed those group of people 
that the superpowers of the day fail to transform. He not only transformed them in a very short period of time, in a period of 23 years, the Prophet ﷺ made those people who were regarded as Asfal Safilin, as the best people to walk on the face of this earth after the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. What was the reason for this? And that's what relates to us. What was the reason? See, the Prophet wasalam gave the Sahaba a vision. He gave them a motive. He gave them a mission. And that's the mission that Muslims today need to recapture. That from being the Asfal Safilin, from being a group of people that nobody wanted to rule over, a time comes that you become the most powerful people on the face of the earth. Not only powerful, but humanity wants you to rule over them. Humanity wants to emulate them. This is what the Prophet ﷺ created. He created, let me say, in brief, he created a group of people with a vision, with a goal. You know, people have visions, business plans. They have a 10-year business plan, a 20-year business plan. As Muslims, what's our vision? What's our plan? Let me give you an example of how the Prophet ﷺ gave him a vision. The Battle of Khandaq was a battle is also known as the Battle of the Confederates, the Battle of Ahzab. This was a battle where all the enemies of Islam united against the Muslims. Everybody united against the Muslims. And then they marched upon Medina. The Muslims were a fraction of their number. And what the Muslims did is that they began to dig a trench at the front of Medina. Because the only way that you could enter Medina was either from the front or from the back. And then from the back, you had Bani Qur'aidha who had a treaty with the Muslims. So they dug this trench. And it's mid-winter. And the Muslims are starving. They come to the Prophet ﷺ and they say, O Messenger of Allah, we haven't had anything to eat. And they remove their garment and they have stones tied to their stomach. And the Prophet ﷺ removed his garment and he had two stones tied to his blessed stomach. And the Prophet ﷺ, it's midwinter, it's cold, the Muslims are starving. And whilst this is happening, they're digging a trench. You have the enemy on the other side. And they call the Messenger of Allah, they say, oh, Messenger of Allah, we've reached a boulder. We've reached a a large rock, we can't break it. Come and break it for us. So the Messenger of Allah goes and he strikes the boulder and the third of it breaks and there's a huge spark and the Prophet says, Allah Akbar. And then he strikes it again. Another third of it breaks and there's a huge spark and the Prophet says, Allah Akbar. And then he strikes it a third time and it breaks into small pieces and there's a huge spark. And the Prophet ﷺ says, Allah Akbar. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ask, O Messenger of Allah, what was the Allah Akbar about? What was the spark about? And the Prophet ﷺ said, When I struck it the first time, Allah showed me through the spark that the day would come that we the Muslims would take the palaces of Yemen. And when I struck it the second time, Allah showed me a time that we would take the Byzantine palaces in Sham. And when I struck it the third time, Allah showed me through the spark that the day would come, that we would take the palaces of the superpower of the time, the white palace in Madain. And the Munafiqeen who didn't believe, you know what they said? They said, look at this man. He's promising them that they will be a superpower. And one of, us is shy, one of us is scared to go out and relieve himself. But he gave the Sahaba this goal. And within a period of 10 years after this, in the time of Umar ibn Khattab, after the battle of Qadzia, Yarmouk and Nahwand, the Muslims in 10 years became that superpower. Why? Because the Messenger of Allah gave them a goal. He gave them a vision. 
And they pursued it because they believed the words of the Prophet ﷺ. And today, where is that vision of the Muslims? Where is that vision? Where is that goal that we were meant to have? That aims that we were meant to have? Adi ibn Hatim, very famous Sahabi. For those who have studied, know his name. Adi ibn Hatim says, I decided... I heard about this man called Muhammad, he regarded himself as a prophet. So I decided to go and visit him. I thought to myself, if he's a true prophet, fine. And if he's not a true prophet, I will find out. So Adi ibn Hatim goes to Medina. And he's with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa walking through the street of Medina. And this old African lady comes in front of him. A slave woman. And she stops the Messenger of Allah. And she says to the Messenger of Allah, she says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, speak to my master. He overburdens me. He works me too hard. Speak to him. The lowest people that you could have in that society were people who were slaves and then women who were slaves. And Adi ibn Hatib says, when this woman stopped the Prophet Wasallam, I realized that this man is not a king. Because kings and princes, you can't stop them on the streets. And Adi ibn Hatim was a prince himself. He said, I realize that this man is not a king. He must be something else. And then the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, he said to this lady, he said, take my hand and take me to any street in Medina and ask for me for assistance. I will assist you. I will assist you. This was the greatest of creation, the most busiest of people. But he was, me- he was ready to help those who were the lowest in society. And this is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And then Adi ibn Hatib went to his house. And the Prophet ﷺ said to Adi, he said, Oh Adi, embrace Islam. And Adi said, I'm already on a religion. He was a Christian. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I know more about your religion than you do. And then the Messenger of Allah began to speak about Christianity. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Adi, a time will come that a woman will travel from Hira, which is in Iraq, and she will come to Mecca all by herself. And nobody will disturb her on the way. Nobody will touch her. And she will come to Mecca and she will do tawaf around the Kaaba. He said, Oh Adi, a time will come that we the Muslims will take the Persian Empire. That the treasures of Hurmuz bin Kisra will come to us. Kisra bin Hurmuz will come to us. And Adi said, you telling me, he's telling the Prophet Wasallam, you telling me a time will come that the Muslims will take the superpower of the day? And the Prophet Wasallam said, yes. He said, oh Adi, a time will come that people will take out their zakat and there will be nobody there to accept their zakat. Adi ibn Hatim says, I embraced Islam. He says, by Allah, I saw those women who traveled from Hira to to Mecca all by themselves and did tawaf and nobody touched them. Nobody interfered with them. He says, I was amongst those who initially doubted, but I was in that army which took the Persian kingdom. And he said, if these two things came true, then truly a day will come that the Muslims will take out their sadaqah and they will take out their zakat. And there will be nobody there to accept it. He said, that day will come even if I don't say it. And the time of Umar ibn Khattab, There were many places in Yemen where people took out their zakat and there was nobody to take it. In a very short period of time, this is the justice that Islam bought. In the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, his governor of North Africa, Yahya bin Saeed, Yahya bin Saeed wrote a letter to Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. He said, O Amir al-Mu'mineen, in the whole of North Africa, you know what North Africa, where they just had the Arab Spring. He said, there's nobody to give zakat to. We can't find anybody to give zakat to. So he said, find some non-Muslim. He said, we can't even find any non-Muslim who is ready to take the zakat. Then he said, if you find any slaves 
free those slaves with that money. The whole of North Africa, there was nobody to take zakat. Because the Prophet ﷺ said a time would come. Now I ask you, my dear respected brothers and sisters, you had these people who were regarded as the lowest of the lowest, and they became the best of people. Now what's our state? How are we as Muslims today? 1.5, 1.5 billion in number. But what, what are we regarded by the rest of humanity? We are regarded as fifth columns. We are regarded as the Prophet ﷺ said many, many years ago. Subhanallah. He gathered the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And he said, a time will come that the people will call against you like they call towards a platter of food. They will call against you like they call towards a platter of food. They will give dawah. Take this part of the Muslim land. You take this part of the Muslim land. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Will we be small in number then? And the Prophet ﷺ said, No, you will be huge in number. Maybe he meant that you will be 1.5 billion in number because the Sahaba were only few in number. But you will be sick. You will be regarded by the rest of humanity as the Ghutha. The Ghutha is sail. You know the Ghutha, what the Ghutha is? It's not the froth. It's actually the scum which accumulates in the froth. The leaves, the twigs. And if you look at the sifa of the ghutha, is that it's very light. The quality of the ghutha is very light. It goes with the flow. Wherever the river flows, wherever the sea goes, it goes with it. It has no vision of its own. And the second quality of the ghutha, it's light. Today you see, you, today you see that the Muslim blood is light. It's very light. It's light as the Gutha. The Muslim civil liberties are light. Why? Because the Muslims have become ill. And the Prophet ﷺ said that you will be afflicted by a sickness. And he said, what is that sickness? He said, Wahan. And the Sahaba asked, what is Wahan, Ya Rasulullah? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Hubbud dunya wa kirahiyatul maut. You will love the dunya. You will love this existence. You will do anything to stay here. This will be your priority. And you will hate that thing which takes you away. And that is death. That is death. You will hate that thing which takes you away. And you will hate death. And this is what has happened to the Muslims today. We are large in number. How large are we? Out of every fifth person that walks on the face of this earth, one is a Muslim. But where's the goal? Where's that vision? Because as Muslims, we don't have any limitations. We don't have any limitations. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever intends to do a good action, and even he, if he is unable to do that good action, Allah will write it for him. Look at this. As far as your business is concerned, you can work day and night, and you will only get that which Allah has decreed for you. But as far as the deen is concerned... As far as the deen is concerned, there is no limitations. MashaAllah, this madarsa was started by Mufti Shabil, rahmatullah alayh. Passed away at the age of 39. Started off in a house. I'm sure this madarsa was not uh, this big when Mufti Shab, rahmatullah alayh, passed away. But all this is a sadqa jariya for him. And they, this is why they say, the best action that you can do is that action which outlives your existence. And in the Islamic narrative, we call it Sadqa Jariya. That you lie in the depths of your grave. Today we went to Mufti Sahib's grave. He's lying in the depths of his grave. But me standing here, he's getting rewarded for it. Every single student sitting here studying, he's getting rewarded for it. And this is why Islamically we have no limitations. We have no ceilings. There is no ceilings for believers. If you intend to do an action, and you are unable for some reason to do that action, Allah will still reward you for that action. How beautiful. How beautiful. Abdullah ibn Mubarak, rahmatullah alayhi. Abdullah ibn Mubarak was a very unique figure. Mufti Taqi Saab, Hafizahullah says, that out of all the imams, 
The only Imam that was never criticized was Abdullah ibn Mubarak. All the other Imams, maybe Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim, the authors of the Siha, the Imams of the four Madhahib, somebody or the other criticized them. Abdullah ibn Mubarak was never criticized. One year Abdullah ibn Mubarak would go for jihad, and the second year he would go to he would go for Hajj. He lived in a place called Merv, which is Central Asia. That's where he lived. And he would go for Hajj every other year. One year he went to Hajj. After Hajj, completing the Hajj, he's sleeping. And he sees a dream that two angels descend. And one angel says to the other angel, how many people attended the Hajj? So one angel says that 60,000 people attended the Hajj. So he asked the angel, how many Hajj was accepted? He said, none. Besides one person who didn't even come for the Hajj, he was at home, but his Hajj was accepted. And his name is Abdullah ibn Muqaffal. He's a cobbler and he lives in Damascus. Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahmatullah alayhi stands up. He's perspiring. He's shaking. 60,000 people have come for Hajj and nobody's Hajj has been accepted. He wakes up and the next morning he leaves for Damascus. He goes to Damascus. He asks the people of Damascus, do you know Abdullah ibn Muqaffal? And they said, yes. He said, a cobbler. They said, yes, this is his house. He goes, he knocks on the door. Abdullah opens the door. He asks him name. He asks him his profession. And then he tells him about the dream. He said, tell me the truth. I saw this dream that you didn't even come for hajj. But your hajj is accepted. So Abdullah ibn Muqaffal said, you know, I am a cobbler, poor person. For the last 20 years, I've been wanting to go for hajj. And I have been saving money every year for the last 60 years. Sorry, for the last 20 years. And this year, I had enough money to go for hajj. And my wife became pregnant. And one day, my wife smelled meat from the neighbor's house. And you know, pregnant women, when they want something, they want it there and then. So she said to me, go to the neighbor's house and ask them for that meat. So I went to the neighbor's house. I knocked on the door. The lady opened the door and I said, my wife is pregnant. She smells some meat. Can I have some of that meat? And the lady said to me, that meat is halal for us, but haram for you. Halal for us, but haram for you. So I said, how can it be halal for you and haram for us? And she said, for many days, my children have had nothing to eat. And today, I was walking on the street, and I saw a dead donkey, a carcass of a dead donkey. And I cut the meat from the donkey. And I came and I cooked it for my children. And what you are smelling is that meat. So it's halal for us, but haram for you. Abdullah al Muqaffal says, I went home. I gathered all the money that I had saved for the last 20 years. And I gave it to this lady. And I said, this is my hajj. This is my hajj. He didn't go for hajj. But Allah rewarded him for the hajj. As the poet says, Ya rahilina ila al-bayt al-atiq Sirtum jasuman wa sirna arwahan Inna aqamna ala udhrin wa an qadrin he said, oh, you are going to the Baytul Atik. Oh, you are going to the house of Allah for Hajj. Sirtum jusuman wa sirna arwahan. You went with your bodies, we are going with our souls. If we couldn't go due to an other, an excuse, or the fact that Allah had not decreed for us to go, for those who remain behind because of an excuse, it's as though they have gone for Hajj. And the battle of Tabuk, this was the battle which was known as the difficult battle. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum gathered. This was the battle where Abu Bakr bought everything that he had. Where Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhum bought half of what he had. This was the battle where Uthman radiallahu anhu prepared a third of the army. This was the battle where there were certain Sahaba who came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And they said, oh Messenger of Allah, we want to go for the jihad. Because it's around about 600 miles to Tabuk. 
but we don't have shoes to wear. We don't have shoes. And the Prophet ﷺ said, I have no shoes to give you. And they left the gathering and they were crying. And they were given the permanent name as Al Bukaun, the weepers. And today, until today, their names are recorded. When the Prophet ﷺ was returning, he stopped with the Sahaba and he spoke to the Sahaba and he said, Inna fil Madinati la rijalan. Ma sirtum masiran wa ma qata'tum wadiyan illa kanu ma'akum. He said, in Medina, they are men. There are men. No, no space did you traverse. traverse. No, nor did you walk anywhere. Nor did you go over any valley. But they were with you in reward. They were in Medina. They didn't come. But every step that you took, they got their reward for it. And this is the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We invest in our hereafter. We are believers who have a high vision. We are people who have high aspiration. We have alul himma. That's what we are like. We are, we are people who don't take second best. Second best is not an option for those who work for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mufti Wasim will not take second best. Your boss, wherever you work, will not take second best. And you want to give Allah second best? You want to give Allah second best? And then you speak about the ummah being in the decay that it is, the decadence that it is. We are people, you know, who aspire. We are people who have a positive view on life. Why? Because we know that everything happens through the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn al Jawzi or Ibn al Qayyim Jawzi, one of the two, gives an example of a dog. A dog comes to the lion and he says, You know, change my name. Because every time when somebody wants to curse somebody else, they say, You dog, you're, you're deceptive like a dog, you're treacherous like a dog. He said, Change my name. So the king, the lion of the jungle, said, I ain't changing your name, you deserve it. You deserve the name. You know, nowadays in America, they say, Yo, dog. You know, for somebody, for the homie, or for somebody who's close to them, because you're loyal like a dog. You couldn't translate that in Urdu. It wouldn't work. So, the lion says to him, You deserve the name. So the dog says, try me, give me a chance. So he says, okay, here's a piece of meat. <clears throat> look after it until tomorrow morning. If you manage to look after it tomorrow morning, I will change your name. So the dog, he's got the meat in front of him and he's looking after the piece of meat. Half the night passes, no problem. Second half of the night, he's eyeing the meat now. He's thinking... That meat would be tasty. But he managed to control himself. Last part of the night, the dog nuffs gets better of him. And he says, he's beginning to talk to himself. He said, dog? He said, dog is a good name. He said, who said dog is a bad name? He justifies it to himself. He justifies it and then he devours the meat. Ibn Jawzi, rahimahullah, says, this is an example of people who have low himma, who have low aspirations. They will justify to themselves their state. They will not want to change. And you often see this when you speak into people. You know, anything that you say to them, they have a negative perception. You say, bro, we want to do this. Go, nah, don't bother, yaqi. No benefit, yaqi. No benefit, brother. You mention any person to them, he's got something to say. Chronic pessimism. Pessimism so chronic that it's a contagious. It stifles the community. You say to him, brother, you know that madarsa, darlum, or whatever, he's got something to say. He's got something to say. And these are the people who have low him. As believers, we trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
that we want to make a change. But where does that change start from? Where does the change start from? The change starts from you. You cannot speak about revolutionizing the world if you can't change yourself. You cannot talk about liberating Palestine or the state in Syria or in Burma or wherever the crises are taking place. You see this all the time. Brothers, sisters, two o'clock in the morning, they're speaking about Palestine. You know, Palestine, liberating Palestine. Come for Jerusalem, our hero sleeping. And I'm not saying you can't speak about Palestine if you don't pray for Jerusalem, but we have a thing called priorities. The help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends according to your actions. On the battle of Qadisiya, Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu he said to Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, he said, oh Saad, let me tell you something. They were going to meet the superpower of the day. He said, the vast majority of people who lose on the battlefield is not because of numbers and weapons, but is because of their sins. Because when you commit a sin, the help of Allah is removed. It is removed. And so the real change starts it starts from me and you. It starts from within. If you can't revolutionize yourself, you're not going to revolutionize the world. There's a beautiful example of a man who comes home. And he says, and this young toddler child wants to play with him. He's a young child. And the father just come back from work and he's tired. So he says to his son, he says, give me a few, give me half an hour. I want a cup of tea. I want to put my feet up. When I'm finished, you know, we'll chill. And the boy wants to play. So what he does, he sees a map on a newspaper. So he tears this map up. So he said, son, put the map together. When you put the map together, then we will play. So the boy goes back. Within a few minutes, he thinks the father thinks he's got half an hour, he'll have a cup of tea and he'll relax. Within half an hour, the boy's back. And he's put everything together. Australia is where it's meant to be. UK is where it's meant to be. Even Trinidad is where it's meant to be. Even found Trinidad. And he puts Trinidad, everything. And the father is shocked. He said, my son must be a genius. He did it so quickly. So he said, he said son, how did you do it so quickly? So the son turned it around. And on the other side, there's a picture of a man. He said, oh dad, I put the man right and the world came right itself. I put the man right and the wor right, world came right itself. If we become right, if our households are right, if we are right, that is our first step. But that is the most difficult step. That is the most difficult step. That we put ourselves, our homes, our communities right. And when you do that, and when you have that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then many things which are difficult become easy. Because Allah inspires you. Allah inspires you. You look at the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. The vast majority of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were people who could not read and write. You look at Rabi ibn Amir. Rabi ibn Amir radiallahu anhu stands up in front of Rustam. Rustam is the second most powerful man on the face of this earth. And Rabi ibn Amir goes to Rustam. Who was Rabi ibn Amir? Let me tell you. Rabi ibn Amir was a Sahabi. If this incident hadn't happened, maybe you would have never heard his name. He's not a famous Sahabi. He's African in origin. He was a slave all his life. The Saad ibn Abi Waqqas chose Rabi ibn Amir. And he goes to the tent of Rustam. And they say that tent was embellished like it had never been embellished before. It had silver lining. They're in the battlefield. But this is the pomp and the glory that the Persian lived in. They had these cushions which had rubies and emeralds upon them. Because they thought that this Bedouin, he would see. He would see all this pomp and glory. And he would be overawed. But Rabbi ibn Amir reaches the tent. And they tell Rabbi ibn Amir, descend from your mount. And Rabbi ibn Amir radiallahu anhu says, I will not descend from my mount. You call me, you will accept my conditions. And then Rabbi ibn Amr enters the tent on his mule. And all this dunya around him, none of this dunya affects him. 
None of this dunya affects him. Why? Because these were people of Iman. They understood that the wealth that they had, the wealth of Iman was greater than any of the dunya. Today, you know, anything diverts us. We get a rise at work, and all of a sudden, you know, oh, we are ready to compromise the deen. We get promotion at work, all of a sudden, you know, salah becomes very secondary. It's my, it's my future, it's my career. The boys, the youngsters, you know, anything takes them away. A few negative images about Islam on the media, and all of a sudden the iman begins to shake. If the iman was strong, it wouldn't shake. Boy gets involved with a girl, all of a sudden the beard goes, the thobe goes, for the girl the hijab goes. Is that all it took? Is that all it took? If you look at the salaf and the pious predecessors, you know, you looked at their piety. Look at Fudayl ibn Ayaz. Fudayl ibn Ayaz was who? He was, he, you could say he was the gangster of his time. He was the gangster of his time. For Dayl ibn Ayyad, he would rob even the hajis. He spared nobody. The hajis would not stop in the area where Fadail ibn Ayyad and his boys were. One day, Fadail ibn Ayyad sees a group of people going for hajj, and he hears the people saying, let's move quickly, this is the place of Fadail and his boys. And Fadail ibn Ayyad hears this, and something hits his heart. And he comes to these people and he says to them, he says, look, I will protect you from Fadail ibn Ayaz. They don't know this is Fadail ibn Ayaz. They said, I will protect you. They said, ah, alhamdulillah. He said, come and stay with me tonight. Fadail ibn Ayaz, I know him, he won't touch you. So they stay with him. And that night, somebody's reciting the Quran. Alam ya'ni lilladheena amanu an takhsha' quloobuhum. Has it not the time come? For those who believe in Allah, that their hearts submit for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Has not the time come that those who believe in Allah, that their hearts submit out the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And for Dhail ibn Ayaz hears this, and he says, my time has come. He says, my time has come. And all of a sudden, that for Dhail ibn Ayaz became who? He was known as Abid al-Haramain. The worship of the two harams. Why was he known as Abid al Haramain? He was known as Abid al Haramain because they say that there was no place in the two harams that the fear, that the tears of Fadail ibn Ayaz did not fall out of the fear of Allah. From being a gangster, from being a man who would not even spare the hajis, he becomes a wali who has inspired millions. Is that your role model? Or is that the local celebrity? Or some rap artist your role model? Who is your role model? Because you're cheap. In all honesty, if you are substituting the Sahaba, the Awliya, the Prophet ﷺ for some celebrity, then you're cheap. Because people, true, the youth who know that they are going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they know they're going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then they resist the temptations around them. And that is the sign of a living human being. A person whose heart is living, he resists the temptation. My friend Sheikh Yawar, he says, he gives an example. He says, dead fish, dead fish go with the flow. Living fish swim against the current. Yet dead, you go with the flow. Whatever is around you, whatever society portrays to you, you go. Today the fashion is this, tight, you wear tights. Tomorrow the fashion is loose pants, you wear loose pants. The day after they were wearing the Palestinian scarf, you start wearing the Palestinian scarf. Brother, why are you wearing the Palestinian scarf? Bro, it's the cause. It wasn't the cause before the celebrities wore it. Now all of a sudden it's become the cause. They tell you to wear your trousers halfway down your backside. You wear your trousers halfway down your backside. Where's the hair? Let me tell you about another sheikh, another gangster. Imam al-Ka'nabi. Imam al-Ka'nabi is a narrator of Muatta. 
He's a, one of the students of Imam Malik rahimahullah. He was once sitting and Imam Sha'bi was coming with an entourage. And this was the local gangster. So he asked them, he said, who's this man? Who was this following he's got? He said, this is Imam Sha'bi. He's a muhaddith of his time. A great scholar. He said, great, great scholar? Hadith scholar? He said, okay. He went and he stood in front of the mount of Imam, Imam Sha'bi. And he said, narrate to me narrations. He said, read hadith for me. He said, you're not a muhaddith, nor are you a student of deen. Why should I read to you? So he took out his knife. He took out his knife and he put it by the throat of Imam Sha'bi. And he said, narrate for me. Either you narrate or this goes inside you. Imam Sha'bi says, Haddathana Mansur and the Rabai and Ibn Masood. Qal, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam iza fatak al-haya fasna ma'ashit. He says that Mansur narrated from Rabai from Ibn Masood radiyallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said when your haya when your shame dies, you will do whatever you wish. He said these words. The words permeated the heart of Imam Ka'nabi. He went home. He did tawbah. He went and he studied by Imam Malik for a very, very long time. From becoming a gangster, he becomes the imam of his time. The ulama say, that he was the most, one of the most authentic narrators of the Muatta. From where did he start and where did he end? So Rabbi ibn Amir radiallahu anhu goes into the tent. And the dunya doesn't affect him. And he enters the gathering of Rustam. And Rustam is sitting on his, crown, on his bed which is made out of gold. And around him are his cronies. And when they see Rabbi ibn Amir radiallahu anhu, they begin to laugh. Because they see this man, dark skinned, riding a mule. He's got patches on his clothes. His sword, the sheath of his sword was made out of a cloth. And the tip had a piece of leather. And they begin to laugh. Why? Because they judged him by the zahir. They judged him by his apparent. But little did they know that under that dark skin, Patchy clothes were characteristics which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines as radiyallahu anhum wa radhu an. That Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with their abode by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Rabbi ibn Amir radiyallahu anhu, he gets off his, off his mount and they had placed a cushion for him. And he removes the cushion and he sits on the floor. And Rustam asked him, why are you sitting on the floor? He said, I prefer to sit on the earth of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Rustam asked him, he said, why have you come? Why have you come? And Rabbi ibn Amir radiallahu anhu says, what does he say? He said, wallahu ta'athana. What does he say? He didn't say that Saddam ibn Waqah sent me. He didn't say that Umar ibn al-Khattab Amir al-Mu'mineen sent us. He didn't say that the messenger of Allah sent us. What did he say? He said, Allah has sent us. Wallahu ta'athana. Li nukhrija man sha'a. مِنْ إِبَادَةِ الْإِبَادِ إِلَىٰ إِبَادَةِ رَبِّ الْإِبَادِ وَجَوْرِ الْأَدْيَانِ إِلَىٰ عَدْلِ الْإِسْلَامِ وَضِيكِ الدُّنْيَا إِلَىٰ سَعَةِ الْآخِرَةِ He said, Allah has sent us to remove whoever He wishes from the servitude of man to the servitude of the Lord of man. If anybody knew the servitude of man, it was Rabbi ibn Amir. Because he remained in the servitude of man all his life until he embraced Islam. And then he became the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the unjust nature of other religions and other systems to the justice of Islam. And the, from the tight confinement of the dunya to the vast expansion of the hereafter. This is what happens. Rabbi ibn Amir, when Rustam went to his people, a long discussion, I don't have time to go through it, but when Rustam went to his people, he said to his people, he said, have you ever seen a man who is more articulate than this man? And more confident. And you know what Rustam's crony said to him? He said, oh Rustam, do not incline to the religion of this dog. Don't you see his mount? Don't you see his ride? Don't you see his clothes? They judged him by the zahir. Like many of us today, we judge people by their dunya. 
The respect that we give people is by the dunya. The ruder the youngster is, the more respect that he gets on the street. The richer the person is in the mosque committee, the more respect that he gets. Rizq is written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There was a time when Muslims respected each other for the khair, for their good, not for their bank balances, not for the cars that they drove, not for how good looking you were, because your looks are, have, you have nothing to do with the looks. You have nothing to look, do with the looks. And by Allah, no matter how good looking you are, on the day of judgment, if you have utilized your looks for haram, then you will wish that you were ugly in this dunya. On the day of judgment, no matter how good looking you are, no matter how the women flock for you in this dunya, no matter how the men flock for you in this dunya, by Allah, you will all be naked. You will all be naked and nobody will give you a second glance. Nobody will give you a second glance. That's your reality. No matter how good looking you are, when you're placed in that grave of yours, the, the spiders and the worms will run through those hairs of yours and those sockets of, eye sockets of yours. Allah makes people beautiful because He wants to test them. He wants to see what you do with that beauty. Are you inclined towards your upper sex? Do you transgress the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or do you say, Alhamdulillah, Allah has made me like this, but the thing that really counts is my character. So Rabbi ibn Amir, radiallahu anhu, he knew what it meant from being a slave. So they say to Rustam, they said, don't you incline toward the religion of this dog. And Rustam, you know what he says? Rustam says, fool, don't you understand? That these people are not concerned about the dunya. These people have a greater goal. They're not concerned about their clothes or what they ride. Rustam met one believer, one meeting, and he understood that these people were different. Rabbi ibn Amir hadn't studied in Harvard University or Oxford University or any other university. He hadn't studied in an Azhar or Dioband. But when he spoke, Allah was the tongue by which he spoke. Allah was the hands by which they held. Allah was the eyes by which these people saw. Because they were close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why, my dear respected brothers and sisters, when we create that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, things become easy. Things become easy. Those things that we thought were difficult become very, very easy. In the time of the Prophet, so our goals are what? And, I, and I'm going to finish off here. Our goals are what? Our goals are high aspirations. We don't have low aspirations. We are people who aspire for the highest. We aspire for the highest. When the Prophet wasallam told the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, he said, when you ask for Jannah, what kind of Jannah do you ask for? He said, ask for Jannah to Firdaus. Firdaus, the highest of Jannah, second best, is not good enough. Upon occasion, the Prophet wasallam was sitting with the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. And there was a Sahabi sitting next to him called Rabi ibn al-Ka'b. And this was a time when great wealth from Bahrain came into the Muslim lands. Never in the history of Islam had so much wealth ever come into the Muslim lands. And the Prophet ﷺ told the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, he said, oh, sah, he said, spread all the wealth in the masjid. And they spread all the wealth in the masjid. And the Sahaba come, and they ask the Messenger of Allah, can we have some? And the Prophet ﷺ says, yes. Another one comes, Prophet ﷺ says, yes. As one of the Sahaba, if I remember rightly, it was Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu said, he said the Prophet ﷺ didn't have the word la in his vocab. He never said no to anybody. Anybody wanted help, the Messenger of Allah was there. So another one comes and he said, take. Another one comes, take. Abbas who took so much that he couldn't even carry it. That's how much they came and they took. And there's a Sahabi radiallahu anhu next to the Prophet. ﷺ. His name was Rabi ibn Ka'b radiallahu anhu al-Aslami. And the Prophet ﷺ turned to Rabi 
And he said, Oh Rabbi, ask, I will give you. He said, Oh Messenger of Allah, whatever I ask for, you will give me? He said, Ask, I will give you. So Rabbi radiallahu anhu said, Oh Messenger of Allah, I ask you one for one thing, and one thing only. I ask you for your companionship in Jannah. Nothing else. I ask you for your companionship in Jannah. Nothing else. And the Prophet ﷺ said, is there anything that you want? Take some of this. And Rabbi ibn and Rabbi radiallahu anhu said, the messenger of Allah, that is enough for me. And the Prophet ﷺ said, assist me in assisting you by doing profuse sujoods, doing profuse prostrations. Do prostrations and inshallah, you will be my companion in Jannah. Not only Jannah to Firtaus, but with the message of Allah sallallahu wasallam. But what did the Prophet sallallahu say to him? He didn't just say to him, okay, that's fine. You ask for it, I will, I will give, you will, it will be granted. He said, no, no, carry on with your action. Do the prostrations. Do the actions. You know what they say about the Japanese? Japanese work to attitude, attitude to work is what? If... If he can do it, I can do it. If nobody can do it, then I must do it. They say, you know what the Arab and the Middle Eastern attitude and the Muslim attitude to work is? They say, Wallahi, if he can do it, let him do it himself. Ya Habibi, if nobody can do it, how you expect me to do it? But this is not the attitude that Muslims should have. Muslims who are people who are high, we have high aspirations. We have alul himma. And you see this in the life of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. That we are people who are muta'addi. We are transitive in our nature. The Prophet sallallahu gave this beautiful example. And, I'll, uh, and I will finish it, in Allah willing. That, this, I often say this. But mashallah, you are such a good audience. You just keep inspiring me. He gave an example of three people who were traveling from the Bani Israel, from the people of before. And while they're traveling, it begins to rain. So they take shelter in a cave. And whilst they're taking shelter in the cave, a rock descends and it covers the mouth of the cave. So they heave, they push to no avail. And then they decide they can't do anything and they lie down waiting for death. And then one of them stands up and he raises his hands to the heavens and he says, Oh Allah, I had elderly parents and every night before my parents would go to sleep, I would milk the cattle and I would give the milk to my parents. One day I went far away to attain the fodder. By the time I came back, my parents had gone to sleep. My children wanted the milk, they were hungry. But I did not feel it fit that I give my children milk before my parents. So I told my wife, put the children to sleep. And all night, I stood by the bed of my parents with the milk in my hands. And when they woke up, I gave them the milk and they drank it. He said, oh Allah, if you know that I did this action solely for your sake. Then remove the rock. And the rock moves, but not enough for them to come out. Then the second one stands up. He said, oh Allah, I had a cousin. I was infatuated by my cousin. There was no woman that I loved more than my cousin. Many times I made a move on her, and every time she turned me down. One day she came to me, she was in desperate need of money. And she said to me, give me some money, I am in desperate need. And I said on one condition, that you allow me to have a relationship with you. And because she was in desperate need of the money, she agreed. And he says, when I became, came close to her, she said to me, Ittaqillah, fear Allah. Do not break the seal unless you are the rightful owner, unless you are the husband. He said, when she said, Ittaqillah, fear Allah, those words permeated my heart and I moved back because the fear of Allah penetrated my heart. He said, Oh Allah, if you know 
that I done this action solely for your sake. Then remove the rock. And the rock moves. But not enough for them to come out. Then the third one stood up. He said, oh Allah, I hired a group of people. And come evening when it's time for them to take their wages, all of them took their wages besides one. And what I did with his one day wages is that I invested it until there was a valley full of livestock. A valley full of livestock. And many days later he came back and he said, he said, oh servant of Allah, I need that one day wages. So he, I took him and I said, you see all this? All this belongs to you. And he said, oh servant of Allah, do not joke with me. For I am in need of this money. Well, in English we would say, you're having a laugh. You're having a laugh. You're laughing, you're joking with me. He said, no, that was this one day wages and we invested it for you. And it mushroomed and it grew and this is all yours. And the person, he takes all that belonged to him. He said, oh Allah, if you know that I done this action solely for your sake, ikhlas, solely for your sake, then remove the rock. And the rock moves. And it moves enough for all of them to come out. Now let me ask you a question. If me and you were the fourth person in that cave, by what action in our life that we've done would we ask Allah to remove the rock? What action? And if we haven't done such actions, then we need to become people of actions. Actions don't have to be great, but they have to be great in the eyes of Allah. Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahimahullah said, through ikhlas, many small action becomes enormous, huge. And many great action becomes small in the eyes of Allah. But we need to be people of actions. We are believers. We have an iman, which is unequivocal. But let's show that we can do something. Let's make a change. Let's be people who are muta'addi. Let's be, be people who really affect a change within our communities, affect a change in our homes, affect a change within our communities, affect a global change. That's what this ummah should be about. A global change. There's an there's a author, if I remember rightly, his name is Ainsbury, if I remember rightly. He's a, he's a well-known author. He, he tells a story, and I will finish it, inshallah. He comes out of his, he tells a story, he comes out of his hotel. It's by the beach, like Trinidad, like beautiful Trinidad, mashallah. You know, many th one thing I must say, I really admire about you people, is the ease by which you sit with different communities. It's admirable. Africans, Indians, it's very admirable. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give you istiqama because this is very important. The ability to relate to the people around you, may they be Muslim or may they not be Muslim. The ability to create a feeling of an ummah. Very few communities have the ability to do that. Very, very few. And alhamdulillah, it's a very admirable. Maybe it's the barakah of being here 170 years. But this is very important. If you look throughout the Quran, sometimes Muslims have the ability an ability of ostracizing them and isolating themselves, which is not healthy because we are meant to be people who are muta'addi. We are people who are meant to be, people are meant to incline towards us. If you create a barrier, then you will isolate people. You look out throughout the Quran. Every single person, when he every single Nabi, when he spoke to his people, what did he say? He said, Ya Qawmi, my people, my people, Ya Qawmi. They were all disbelievers, but he addressed them, Ya Qawmi. Lut alayhi salatu salam, he addressed his people. You know what their people were up to. There wasn't nothing that Lut alayhi salatu salam agreed with. 
It was something that he came to change. But he's, Ya Qawmi, my people. So they could relate to him. There was a, there, there was, so there would be no barrier. And then the dawah starts. If you look into the life of the Prophet Sallallahu exactly the same. When the Prophet, when the first revelation descended, and he went to Khadija radiallahu anha, and he said to Khadija, he said, Zammiluni, Zammiluni. He said, cover me, cover me. He said, and she, so she gave him a cloth and she said, what happened? And he told her. And he said, Khashitu ala nafsi. She said, I fear for my life. And what did she say? She hadn't prepared a talk on the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu It was spontaneous. She said, Kalla wallahi la Allahu abada. He said, by Allah, Allah will never forsake you because you assist in a nutshell, you assist those who nobody else is ready to assist. The yatims, the widows, the orphans, the widows, the nobodies, the untouchables. You are first to uh, assist them. This was the characteristic of the Prophet Sallallahu before Islam. And this is why when he stood on the mountain of Safa Marwa, he said, if I was ready, if I told you that behind this mountain there are a group of people ready to attack you, would you believe me? And in one voice, they said, of course we will believe you. You are Sadiq, you are al mean You are the trustworthy amongst us. You are the truthful one. When they wanted to give an example of a person who was upright, they would give an example of the Prophet ﷺ. Why? Because he had created that relationship. Generally, with the Muslim community, it's like this. We want to put a dawah stall out, and we want to give verbal dawah, nothing else. We don't want to build a relationship. We don't want to do any social work, any outreach work. But we, what we want to give people da'wah. That is contrary to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ won the hearts and the minds of people. After living amongst them for 40 years, 40 years, he gave them da'wah. Umar ibn Khattab says, I was the 40th person to embrace Islam. Although there was about 12 more people who embraced Islam. But to his knowledge, he says, that I was the 40th person to embrace Islam. After living amongst them for 40 years, being known as Sadiq al Amin, it took six years for 40 people to embrace Islam. Six years. And we want it like, you know, we want it, you know, we live in an instant world. Like you put on the light switch, everybody becomes a Muslim. Like you send an email, everybody becomes a Muslim. The most difficult thing is to do the groundwork. And may, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve you. Because alhamdulillah, I see great khair. I travel quite a bit. And mashallah, the, the way that you brothers and you sisters, mashallah, are comfortable with other communities, that is very admirable. Anyway, I'll come back to Ainsley. That's the author's name, Ainsley. Ainsley says, I came out of my hotel. And this is the change. Change sometimes starts little. But if everybody makes a little change, it makes a big impact. And he says, I came out of my hotel and I saw tens of thousands of starfish washed up on the shore. Tens and thousands. And in the distance, I saw this young man. He's picking up the starfish and he's throwing them into the sea. Picking up another one, throwing into the sea. So I walked up to this young man and I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, these starfish, they've been washed up. If they remain here, they will dry up and they will die. And I said to him, I said, look around you. There's tens and thousands of them. What difference is it going to make that you pick up a few starfish and throw them back in? He said the boy had a starfish in his hand. He looked at me. And then he looked at the starfish. And then he threw it back into the sea. And then he turned to me. He said that it made a difference to that one. It made a difference to that one. And this is why even if we make little changes in our lives, in the community that we live in, you will see the barakah of that will be slowly, you will have a greater change. So may I make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve your community. I make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it grow. It's also admirable that being here 170 years, mashallah, you are still steadfast on your deen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Make this Darloom prosperous. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make those who qualify from this Darloom ulama who are transitive in their nature, who spread the deen, not just to the island of Trinidad, 
but to the world. They become, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make your community a role model. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the gathering. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overlook our sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala overlook our shortcomings. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in this dunya. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reunite us in Jannatul for those. Jazakumullah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.